Okay, well, thanks for having me, uh, University of California at San Francisco. Um, I'm not sure many know that I was actually a fellow with Dr. Carroll uh, from 2006 to 2008. And I just briefly wrote down all the people that I met and um, fell in love with them uh, over those years. Obviously, uh, probably one of the most important times of my life. Um, and it's amazing how many people are now incredibly well known. Um, I'm just thinking about uh, Kirsten Green and, and, and Matt Cooperberg and Ben Breyer, Tom Chi, uh, Seema, who I met, met later, but also close with Annabelle, uh, obviously Chris Kane when I got there, and Badri Kennedy. I mean, it just goes on and on. Mike Shea, Tom Chu, Tom Chi. It's just on and on and on. Dr. Shinohara. I'm just indebted forever for uh, Peter Carroll uh, mixture of people he put together. Uh, and to Peter himself, really, uh, for my whole life. Um, so I'm a proud uh, PRC fellow, and hopefully I've started to make a little bit of a career for myself over the years, uh, and I'm happy to kind of give you this uh, talk. Um, first of all, Californians, this is a tie. I know you guys don't like to wear them, guys, uh, but I like ties. Um, and it's a hard talk to give because I'm so, I spent so many years getting used to giving live presentations with feedback and social cues. Really just looking at a screen makes it maybe hard for me to be uh, funny. And I am naturally very funny. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll laugh at myself. I can only hear myself laughing. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, I haven't taken money from pharma. As Dr. Kuberberg likes to remind me, I have taken money from lawyers, but it's a different animal. Um, and what we're gonna talk about today is opioids in general. And then we're going to move into a study that I just published, just came out on the press about a day or so, or so about how our department moved to uh, zero prescribing in most uh, instances with major urologic surgery. And I'll, I'll go through some of the uh, ideas behind that project and some of that data. And I'll try and make it interesting and show other data from other institutions and where we are generally. Um, just some good slides to make everybody laugh. That's me and Mark Delera, who's vice chair at, uh, um, at Davis, and uh, Dr. Carroll. That's when we were graduating. I think I've lost a little weight since then. That's me and Max. Uh, he looks the same. I look about 20 years younger. Um, and that's uh, Mark again and, and Coops. Some other fine gentlemen who are not at uh, San Francisco. Anyway, always a good, fun uh, group. Somehow, I was looking for pictures of Seema and Kirsten, and I, I think they've, they're just trying to stay away from me. Annabelle never wants a picture with me either. Pryor doesn't care about me. Um, anyway, about myself, this is my favorite slide. Anything about me is fun. Um, I'm basically spent, besides doing urologic oncology, my other part of my life is doing pharmaceutical policy, and that obviously is a general term, but I am part of the public health school um, in the pharmaceutical policy group. Um, and I've written about BCG before, and I've written about um, various policy or health services uh, type subjects. And that's why this kind of uh, came to me naturally, I think, the opioid. But I think when we get sort of shifting into opioid talk, um, I always like to read this slide slowly. And this is a testimony from a, a doctor in 1886 and just read about what physicians knew about opioids all the way back in the late 19th century. I know persons who have been opium, opium eaters for some years who now daily consume enough of this poison in the form of morphine to kill half a dozen robust men not used to the poison. I've heard them with tears in their eyes say that they wished it had never been prescribed for them. I'll just underscore that because we've been given it for 100 years anyway. Many of them have inserted into the flesh frequently during each day, in spite of the painful abscesses it often causes, until in some instances, the whole surface of the body seems to be tattooed. And I've heard them one exclaim with sorrow that there was no longer a place to put it. <clears throat> this is like 19th century uh, heroin addicts. Whilst they know it, it's killing them more or less rapidly, the fascination and power of the drug is irresistible. And it's a rare exception if they ever cease to take it, as long as it can be obtained until they've poisoned themselves to death. Highlighting the point that we've known about opioids addictive powers since 1886 and despite what the pharmaceutical companies and some physicians wanted to tell us in the 70s and 80s and 90s, 
that opioids were not addictive and some weird formulation they came up with um, was not addictive was strictly false. And we knew it was false from probably earlier than the 19th century, but I thought that was a good example of a letter from a physician. If you're interested in opioids and kind of want to jump into this or you have a close friend or family um, affected by why most people around my parts do, these are my four top hit books on what you definitely need to read. They're impactful, they're easy to read, um, they're kind of a must read. The first one, Dreamland by Sam Quinones, um, I won a Pulitzer, it's a beautiful story, uh, such as it had come, um, and a very uh, in-depth description of how the heroin trade started in America and how really heroin is like Uber now. Uh, if you're into heroin, you simply text somebody and they show up a few minutes later. And that was um, started and still persists to this day by the Mexican uh, cartel. Uh, Dope Sick is about, uh, by Beth Macy, also I think one of Pulitzer, I could be wrong, but a very, very popular book nonetheless, about how doctors and pharmaceuticals combined their powers together uh, to addict uh, large tracts of America uh, and lie to the American public horribly. And the pharma book by uh, Gerald Posner is a similar story, uh, a little bit more didactic, uh, a little bit more uh, to the point uh, storytelling. So if you don't want that kind of thing, I would just stick with Dope Sick and Dreamland and you won't go wrong. And the fourth one, I think is a must read for anybody interested in HSR. Um, and I know you have those uh, in H and uh, uh, UCSF. And that's the book by Ann Case and Angus Deaton, a wife and husband team, that, which won the Nobel Prize about the deaths of despair. That's the concept, which I'll talk about briefly, um, uh, of lives lost uh, to uh, addiction. Um, and alcoholism and suicide, uh, and I'll go into that a little bit and how that ties into opioids. Um, this was my best friend in uh, medical school and in college, Elon Kirsch, who I named my son, my first son, after he died on um, on my uh, stoop of the my uh, apartment when I was a medical student uh, from uh, what we suspect was heroin overdose. I didn't know about it at the time that he was an addict, but he, he came to his addiction by way of opioids. And uh, that's kind of gotten me into the topic, um, you know, 10 years later after I thought about it more. <clears throat> I went to medical school with the prior FDA um, head, his name was Scott Gottlieb, who uh, I've been on and off friends with, uh, mostly on recently. Um, and he has a good statement, until clinicians stop prescribing opioids in excess of clinical need, the crisis will continue unabated. And I think Scott is right, um, and we have data to show this, that doctors have a high, high responsibility and causation in a lot of the opioid epidemic started. And we'll talk about some reasons why that is. And also, obviously, it's not, some of it is not our fault, um, and we'll talk about that as well. When you talk, think about the opioid epidemic, what I'd like um, you to think about is really three things happening all at once. Um, and you'll see the purple line, that's from us, that's a, the doctor line, I call it. That's the prescribed opioid addiction uh, and death by opioid. Um, and then you'll see uh, the heroin and the Chinese fentanyl come up. And if you just follow from 1999, Everything was quite rare. I mean, death rates were very low for all three substances, and you really see a huge increase as you walk into the turn of the century. Um, and then you see the walking in of the heroin. That's the book that I mentioned about the heroin, the Mexican cartel walking in. And then you see the Chinese uh, products coming in to the tail end of the uh, 2016, 2017. And of course, if you know anything about opioids, what happens is patients walk between these lines. Uh, you become addicted by opioids by the doctor giving to you, or you steal it from your uncle's stash from his knee surgery. Then you walk to heroin because it's cheaper, and then you walk to Chinese fentanyl because it's even cheaper. So we're going to go over some of the statistics. We'll go over some prescribing rates and overprescribing. We'll talk about persistent opioid use, both in urology and generally speaking. And then we'll talk about the study uh, that my group published just a few um, weeks ago. Uh, yeah, something like that. Um, I always like to think conceptually, how do we get ourselves in here? And that's kind of a hard topic to tackle. Um, and we really are a country full of opioid addicts, something like 30 to 40 million people each year abuse the drug. Maybe not addicted, but abuse it. That's something like one-tenth of the population, depending on how you parse that. 
And then I like to think about how, why do we have all these deaths? And I could have made like a nice Venn diagram and I just like looking like this, uh, thinking about four major causes of how we get all interceding to the middle here. How do we get here? Um, the top left corner, lying about the addiction of opioids. That's absolutely true. People uh, relied on this tiny letter to the New England Journal of Medicine about opioids not being addicted and later discounted and, def and found to be completely ridiculous. Um, we professionalized heroin. It's kind of uber heroin now uh, by the Mexican cartel. And then bottom left, marketing and targeting was a huge problem. Uh, targeting um, susceptible people who had lost their jobs in the, in the, in the breadbasket of America, where I'm from, uh, in um, uh, the middle of the country where the manufacturing jobs are decimated in the past 20 years. They took advantage uh, of that unemployment. Uh, and then we'll talk about the deaths of despair, which ties into the how the marketers targeted. Let's talk briefly about deaths of despair. That's actually a, a, an index that's followed by the government. And that's the ratio of suicide deaths, drug overdose deaths, and alcohol deaths. Um, in Case and Deaton, the Nobel Prize winners I mentioned who wrote that book, they uh, describe and very carefully document about 600,000 extra deaths and that's what it has accounted for, an increased death rate in the white male population of 45 to 54 year olds was unheard of in American society in 200 years. Um, and that's what it's from. It's from loss of manufacturing jobs and increase in opioid addiction um, and alcohol abuse. Just to get to the point about targeting and marketing, this is my only slide on it, but I, it's a fascinating study that was published in the NPER about a year ago. Back in the old days when, when I was a medical student, when you, when you wrote an opioid prescription, you had to write it on this prescription pad, which had three pieces of paper. The front one was like the official one, the middle, middle one went to the state, and the bottom one you kept in your own drawer. So there was three areas that the prescription had to go to and that could be tracked both by the state, uh, by the pharmacy, and by you. And different states decided they would have triplicate laws or not. But what the pharmaceutical companies did was they targeted the states that did not have triplicate laws because they did not want it to be um, found out that they were going after uh, peoples and, and telling them they should take more and more of these opioids. So in those states where there were triplicate laws, look how low in comparison to the non-triplicate laws, look how low the deaths were over the years. And that's because all of the money, about 90% of the pharmaceutical money went and was applied into these non-triplicate states. It's absolutely fascinating. Almost no money was put into the triplicate states. Of course, there's gonna be some bleeding between the two states, but where the pharmaceutical money, pharmaceutical money went is where the deaths were. Our own group, Bruce uh, Jacobs and I, has looked, have looked at this as well, and we've seen direct correlation between opioid-related payments to physicians and to where the opioid crisis is. And, we never really said this was causation, but it's certainly in a, a very tight, not, not a, an association. And in concert with the prior data, it kind of makes you think that yes, perhaps this is associative, um, although not strictly statistically, uh, that where the money walks is where the deaths are. Um, and by the way, the deaths are horrific. This is cannot be underscored enough, and we should update this graph. But this came out from the group that I'm associated with here at UPMC. If you look nationally at the exponential, at the growth of opioid deaths, it's exponential to 2019 now. Um, and I'll say people thought that wasn't going to happen, but it's still happening. It's an exponential growth, and COVID has not helped at all. I like to show this graph because it's such an American phenomenon, opioids. I mean, it's just really not a problem in other countries. Um, and there's some famous, um, interesting uh, uh, essays in the New York Times about somebody um, getting their ankle fractured in Germany and they were kind of like okay well here's some Tylenol and now you can go home. Um, it's a great essay if somebody can find that and tweet it out. Um, but uh, the, op the opioid phenomenon is American and, and anything is close to America. You know Canadians want to pretend like they're American many times, maybe not now, but yeah Can Canada at the border has terrible opioid problems. Uh, but that's really it and there are some places in Russia that have some significant problems but it's very concentrated in Leningrad, um, and Israel also has some problems, but really it's really an American phenomena. Uh, and this was a great study just describing why that phenomena is American, because other countries just do simply do not give opioids out for simple 
surgeries. And this was three common operations. It looked at eight countries. Um, and just look at the frequency of post-operative prescriptions, 91% in America. The rest of the world, it was 5%. We gave 23 pills. The rest of the world gave one pill. Um, it's really, a, really an American phenomenon. Well, is there any hope? Well, we did think there was some hope. And this was data from when I first gave this talk two years ago. We were all kind of excited because it looked like we were turning the corner. Um, in 2017, really the overdose test dropped dramatically. And then um, it went away. It was just a statistical fluke. It's a fluke. And the number is just driven right back up. And it's even worse now with COVID. I'll go into that a little bit. There has been some movement of deaths um, away from where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania to more in the middle of the country and into the Dakotas up there. And that's probably because of fracking. Um, and uh, those areas where men are by themselves uh, snorting um, heroin and coke to get over their um, pain and suffering, I would suppose. Let's talk a little bit about COVID. You can't give a talk anymore about COVID and not talk, mention COVID, but really there's a direct relationship now, we think, with COVID and, and opioid overdose. Uh, and just locally in Pittsburgh, we've had a 28% increase in our naloxone administration. Pittsburgh has also seen a 50% increase in our overdose calls since COVID started in, um, in March, pretty much here. Um, and uh, it's really all over the place. And I just put a few of these uh, uh, articles, you know, um, in Michigan has having a huge increase. Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, Madison County. Um, and the, probably the best example of how to uh, and a project you should vaguely know, and I found out when I went to a Michigan HSR event, something called the Overdose Detection Mapping Program. And each, you know, this is where it, is, it exists. It's where a county uh, has used an, uh, an AI algorithm to, to look for spikes. And really the, the detection program um, factors in um, people dying in hospitals throughout a particular region. And when it reaches twice its uh, standard deviation, a signal goes out uh, to this application. So. Um, you can look up uh, ODAP, o ODMAP and, and read about how it's a very interesting and compelling reaction to the opioid uh, problem. At any rate, look at how much increase has since COVID has started. In some places, uh, it's quadrupled um, these uh, massive alerts and overdoses throughout the whole country. Look where this country represents. It's really a really good mixture. Uh, besides Texas, it really has the West Coast and East Coast covered, and there's been huge spikes throughout everywhere. Not good. I'm going to skip that. <clears throat> this is my talk to um, the younger doctors about uh, why, if possible, you don't want to give oxycodone as your, as your medicine to help with um, post-operative pain. Why? This is a survey of a thousand uh, people who become ad became addicted. And it's really just asking what drug addicted person do you want? And what actually propelled you on to your addiction? Across the board, oxycodone is the drug that most people want because it can be abused. Even with these newer versions of it, it still can be abused. And so please, as a post-operative pain control, you should never really be giving oxycodone on an opioid naive patient, ever. And I would argue that vast, I can't think of a urologic situation where you would need to give that drug, and please don't. Um, if you have to, you're gonna use hydrocodone, uh, even then, I would argue it should be, you know, very small doses, depending on what the patient's used in the hospital. The other thing to remember is dispersion. Um, in other words, how do drugs get to regular folks? And this is another survey data, but it's worth spending one minute on to think about how people become addicted and how they source their drugs. So let's look at the first one. To, this is another. This is about a 500-person survey. And this is um, in the first one to 29 days. How did I get my drug? Well, it was gray. What's gray? Gray is given by a friend or relative for free. Well, that's how people always start their drugs, right? Oh, as a friend has some, I'm going to pop some and then go party. Okay. Well, that's only going to last so long. How do you slow? How, how else do you get your drugs? You get it from your physician as the days go by. You start stealing it. As, the, as you get to the 100 mark, or you get it from your friend, and then finally you get it from your drug dealer. Um, that's the natural progression and dispersion of medicines. That's why it's so important for physicians only to give the finite amount they absolutely patients needs, and not to give these ridiculous amounts that people still give, 
all the time, all around the country, 40, 50 oxycodones a pop for small procedures. Um, you don't think it happens, but I can tell you it still happens even in our own system, and I have to come trying to combat it uh, every day. Um, there is some real hope, and that is that doctors have prescribed much less hydrocodone and oxycodone. This is a national um, uh, data from a, uh, a database that collects wholesale uh, sellers. So it's been an absolutely crushing down spiral of hydrocodone, oxycodone, oxycodone, and fentanyl, which is great. But this tramadol spike is very annoying. And I would tell you, and I know at UCSF, at least they used to, I don't know if it's still the case, I'm sure Dr. Kuber text, text me or something, or Annabelle, um, or Seema, um, text me, oh, it's not true anymore. Well, uh, for some time, tramadol was given out like candy in California and throughout the world. <laughs> really, I would say you should not ever give tramadol. It is, it's a, a worthless drug. Um, let me just tell you about it because I'm, I'm going to have to get on uh, my, my soap box. Tramadol is ineffective, meaning gives no pain relief at all in about one-fourth of patients. Well, that seems like a silly drug to give. Um, in another one-fourth of patients, it's way more, uh, it increases their seizure activity if you have a baseline uh, seizure history. Um, it also med medical neg negatively affects a variety of of uh, values of, of common medicines, hypertensive medicines. Um, so it's really, a, it's kind of a very dirty drug um, and I would suggest not giving it. So why do surgeons prescribe so much? Is it because of time? Is it because of um, not wanting phone calls? Is it because of the pain scores? Is it because of money? Um, I think it's probably all of those things. Um, but most of the pills we give go un go unused. And in the general surgery literature, it's about 72% go unused. If you calculate that out after about almost 2 million operations a year, that's 62 million pills in the general surgery world go unused. That's our best robust data, and that really hasn't changed over the past few years. In urology, we did a small trial um, three, four years ago, and we asked the same question. How much do people actually use if they have a robotic prostatectomy or an open prostatectomy, still do those. Lap or nephrectomies or open prostatectomies. And on average, the excess pills between them were 20 and 30, between 20 and 30 excess pills. In other words, we weren't using them at all. And about 65% in our cohort were unused. And we sent in, in this small time period, 3,800 excessive pills, which is, you know, ridiculous. So how can we stop that? Well, one easy way is, is guidelines. And this is a great representation of how guidelines are used. Uh, when you do a large study, this was done at the University of Michigan, if you do a large, um, if you give somebody a large prescription of opioid pills, on this study, they averaged about six intake. If you give them much less, in other words, you just prescribe less, the patient actually uses less. That's because you've anchored the patient to a smaller prescription. They think the doctor's gonna give you less. And when they did this large study, there were no change in phone calls, no, no change in the pain scores, and no, and no change in, in the pills. And there was much less fewer pills. And that's why guidelines are really powerful because they anchor doctors and, and patients to much lower amounts. This is the, the Michigan guideline. I think they're way too high, but at least if you just follow the guidelines and gave 10 um, oxycodone tablets for a prostatectomy, for instance, I would at least be somewhat happy because right now we, the national average, at least the last data I saw is about 30 to 40. So if we got to 10, that would be a win. It should be zero, but I'll take 10. And one of the reasons we don't want to give opioids besides it being a dispersed in the community is because there's a real rate of persistent opioid use on opioid naive patients. And it's really across the board, the single biggest complication of surgery in general, is a persistent opioid use. And it's shocking when we go through these numbers, and you may not want to believe me, but it's across the board in every discipline, 6% in forecast surgery, 8% in orthopedic surgery, 13% in hand surgery in that series, 13% in spine surgery, 5% in pediatrics, 10% in thoracic, 19% in this breast cancer series. And if you're looking for over, this kind of data in urology, it hasn't been done great in America, but there was a very good study in EU last year um, with a good commentary by my team, um, which looked at um, persistent opioid use in very small minor urologic surgery, not in what we would call big wax surgery. And even then they found about almost a 1.6% uh, 
long-term persistent opioid use after minor surgery, which sounds little, 1.6, but 1.6% from an epidemiologic standpoint is a huge number. And in that same study, people were giving out opioids for vasectomies, TERPs, circumcisions. I mean, it's really a remarkable um, circumstance. So we, we've started thinking about opioid night sparing prostatectomies um, a few years ago, and we've published various different ways to do it, and this is nothing new. People have heard me talk about this for a long time. Uh, we give um, preoperantin, we give single shots, uh, we do total intravenous anesthesia, and postoperatively we give tortol one shot, IV Tylenol one shot, and then it's PO Motrin and PO Tylenol, Tylenol for three days. So we have been doing that for years, and I, I got into my head that I wanted to stop the department from uh, um, doing opioid uh, surgery, not just me, but all, the, all of the faculty. And I thought to myself, well, how are we going to do that? Well, I knew how other people had stopped or incentivized people to stop giving a lot of opioids. And of course, we're all human. We all respond to uh, incentives, uh, money incentives. And of course, um, Michigan has shown this already by changing um, their reimbursement fees for lower um, prescribing of opioids. They gave out a little bit more RVUs, and they massively increased the amount of uh, opioid uh, given by changing the reimbursement. So one way to change behavior is by reimbursement. Another way to change behavior, which we described, is by real health policy. And this has been well described, not just in urology, but in really, really every discipline, uh, every surgical discipline. If you create what we what are called um, prescription drug monitor programs for PDMPs, you will drive the rates down as well, because doctors now have to check the program, go through this big hassle, and that in our own institution dropped the, the, the levels quite significantly by instituting uh, PDMP. It didn't get out, but it went from about 40, uh, 40 oxycodone equivalents to um, about 28 to 30. So two really easy ways, find money and policy will work, but doesn't get you to the end result. It's a picture of my grandma. I think I've shown this before in other lectures. So hi, grandma. And what a, why do I put up the picture of my grandma? Because my grandma, I had to talk to every Sunday. And every Sunday I had to think, okay, what's grandma gonna wanna know? She's gonna know something I did that was nice. So I had to do something nice. It made me think, like, you know, with that kind of person making me be good, um, there's actually a name for that, and that's called the Hawthorne effect, right? The tendency to perform better when we know somebody's watching you. If you know my cute grandma's watching you, you're going to be a little bit nicer. And this is one of my favorite slides, and if you've been to one of my talks before, you've seen it before, but I'm going to show it again for those that have not seen it. This is the famous how much money are you putting in the milk can slide. So let's go through this very slowly, very slowly, not that slow. Um, this is the Hawthorne effect in a surgeon's lounge. Every time you go to get a cup of coffee, you have and put a little bit of milk in it, you're supposed to put in a few cents. Well, the experiment was simple. They put a little poster on top uh, of the uh, jar, next to the jar where you put your money. And the flower weeks <coughs> um, were, you can see the flower weeks um, every other week, and the weeks the posters either had a flower or the poster either had a, had, a, had a pair of eyes. When the eyes were next to the can of money, people plunked in way more money than if the flowers were watching them. So, and if you look at the, that's the last one where it looks like the devil is watching you, people were very quick to put the money in the milk can. And that's the Hawthorne effect. When people are watching you, you have to do the right thing. Now, obviously, you can take this to the drastic scenario where it's ridiculous, but there is something to that, and we all feel that when somebody's watching us, uh, when the intending leaves a room or unscrubs, but kind of peers over your shoulder, you're always like a little bit, okay, I'm gonna do a little bit better job now. Um, so that's one thing, that's the Hawthorne effect. The other thing is anchoring, and I mentioned that before, and I wrote a, 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 an article about this in, um, this is a, uh, whatever, journal, uh, Annals of Surgery. Um, about anchoring to zero. And what I said to our team is I'm gonna give, I'm gonna say for the most of my patients, I'm giving zero. And I just start, my anchor was zero. My anchor is not 10, my anchor is not 20, my anchor is zero. That doesn't mean that I won't give 
opioids if it's demonstrated a necessity, but I'm always going to be at zero. And that's the study that we published last week. Um, we wanted everybody to anchor to zero best they could or massively reduce it. And we were going to use um, behavioral interventions like the Hawthorne effect to drive our, our, our interventions to zero. So our primary outcome in this study is the amount of morphine equivalents after hospital discharge. In our exposure, our interventions is a formal education. I'll go through what this means in a moment. Individual auto feedback and peer comparison. And our secondary outcome are PROs or patient reported outcomes um, from validated uh, pain outcomes questionnaire in the anesthesia literature. So the study design is pretty straightforward for this kind of project. We have a pre-intervention period where we measure exactly what everybody's given. Um, then we do our intervention for about six months, and then we do a, a four-month washout period. So what was our intervention? Um, I stood up in those days in front of people and saw people's faces and stuff, um, and I gave a lecture. Here's why we shouldn't give, here's our personal experience of my own 100 patients who were the prospect, we never got any oxys and they're fine. Then I showed them guidelines. These are what the guidelines in Michigan show. These are what the guidelines that wherever show. Now, I thought the most impactful thing we did were two things. One is individual auto feedback, which is a fancy way of getting a Davies text at the end of the month. Each attending will get a text from me. Hey, you're doing a great job. Oh, hey, you stink. Why did you give so many opioids? And the other thing we did, I think, which has also been shown in various other behavioral studies, something called peer comparison. That is each month, Every attending got a list of how many, how many drugs they gave and for what procedure they did. And that was open sourced. Everybody could see everybody's names and we kind of saw people rise and go down, up and down. And that was, I think, a very um, a good way to get people to change. This is just a horrible slide showing you that my pre-intervention and interventional type of patients didn't really change at all. There's no difference between any of the patients throughout the different um, uh, periods of the study. So here's a kind of um, money slide um, for prostatectomy. In the pre-intervention period, we averaged about almost 200 oral morphine equivalents, and we got that down to about 25. Um, this is a median, um, and that didn't really change the washout at all. So really a big drop with this type of um, intervention. Same with nephrectomy, a big drop, and then a washout to zero, in part because two physicians uh, stopped doing the surgery that were driving our, our, our median, um, but really got to nothing really with uh, MIS nephrectomies. And this is another way to look at it. Each line represents a surgeon, many surgeons, in fact, the majority of surgeons in our group now give no opioids at all, but some do, and that's fine. At least we drove them down by 50 to 100%. Um, again, with nephrectomies uh, driven heavily down. You may be asking yourself uh, some statistical things, and that is, well, if I'm doing the study, how can I be allowed to be participate? That's really kind of a, um, a standard problem in a study called a researcher bias. Well, if I'm doing the research, I should be in the study. Well, that's fair enough. So we did that analysis. We took, I'm the highest volume surgeon with prostatectomies in our group. So we took me out and you still saw a major drop. So that's one sensitivity study we did. Um, and the same thing with nephrectomies. We took the highest, um, nephrectomous out and we still saw the same exact values. Just making the point that our data was consistent uh, even with an obvious bias. Similarly, the, and this is just adding the PI, the two co-PIs, my partner, and we got the same data. Probably the most important data that I think this um, study generated, um, despite the sort of me think it's just obvious, okay, okay, Davies, you got the surgeons to not give the drugs. We get it. Everybody's doing it now. You're not that cool. Fine, I'll take that comment. I won't take it nicely, but I'll take it. But what you probably have never seen before are patient reported outcomes with zero opioid consumption versus those attendings that gave some opioid. And I thought this was remarkable data. It's really split equally. It's about 50 in each cohort. Our response rate for the survey was about 50, 60%. I don't remember exactly, but it was good. And the cohorts are exactly the same. You can reference the paper if you want to see that data. Um, and just let's just look across the look across the span here. Um, less pain experienced, actually better in the non-opioid group, uh, but not statistically different. Worse pain experience, statistically not different. Persistent pain, statistically not different. Time and severe pain, 
absolutely not different between the two cohorts. Activity. Again, no difference in the two cohorts at all. If you've got no opioids or opioids. I mean, this kind of data should really shock you and make you think, why the hell am I giving opioids to my MIS patients at all, ever? Uh, there's no difference between the two patient-reported outcomes. Psychiatrically, I thought this, was, this actually is a significant difference, that people who got the opioids were much more anxious uh, to a degree that you could find it in a survey, um, and statistically significantly more anxious. That's because there is a known, well-known phenomenon with opioid administration that causes anxiety. Um, so we found that signal in our own data. I'm winding down, so I'll expect questions or something. Uh, I don't really know how to use Zoom, so we used Teams at UPMC, not Zoom. Um, but I think I made the point that persistent opioid use after surgery is the number one common complication. You really should not use opioids if you can help it. They're absolutely unnecessary for opioid naive patients in MIS. I firmly believe that. I believe that before we did this study, I believe it even more now that I have solid patient report outcome data. Uh, and you can make your other attendings drive them down if you're willing to do um, social nudges uh, think about grandma looking after you. Um, I was asked to put this slide up, so I'm putting this slide up. Um, give us a good um, report, and I'm happy to take questions if I can figure out how to do that. I did that in 40 minutes, and I'm proud of myself because I usually am much longer winded. Let's see if I can figure out Zoom um, and questions. Um, it's going to be one of these tabs. Okay. Now, what do I do to take a question? I don't know. Somebody help a brother. Oh, Anoop. Thank you for listening, Anoop. The patient satisfaction are interesting. However, there are still patients who are probably still unsatisfied with post-operative pain levels without opioids. How do you reconcile the zero opioid with the sit? Um, okay. I, is it, I'm just going to talk about that. First of all, patient satisfaction scores and reimbursement is a complicated um, answer. Um, in the new iteration of the Prescani, um, the pain scores were taken out. So there isn't a direct reimbursement issue anymore that was taken out of Medicare about a year ago. Um, I'm unaware that, uh, so what else did you want to know? Patients that are, that are interesting, however, unsatisfied. Uh, I, yeah, I think I answered your question, Anoop. Maybe ask me tomorrow that I can really understand it. Okay. Hey, Alex, how are you? Answer live. Um, do you prescribe any LGs after Sertilin Motrin? If so, what's your typical? Yeah, okay. Hopefully, Alex, you didn't miss my screed against Tordal. Um, horrible drug. Please don't give it. Many, many different things you can look up. Just uh, Google Toradol and terrible. Um, yes, of course I do give Motrin. In fact, I give, um, oh, does it say Toradol? Oh, my bad. <laughs> Tramadol, okay. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> Tramadol is terrible. Toradol, I don't use um, really any. I give one dose in the hospital if the patient is not um, able to take PO well. Um, but I basically don't use it anymore. I just use Tylenol and Motrin because our patients can take PO. The MIS patients take PO right away. I send everybody home with um, a pre-ordered bottle of Motrin and Tylenol, which we order from our pharmacy. So you get a little kit um, and you get a little talk from me. Hey, take your, don't forget to take your Motrin and Tylenol. And I make them, I would like them to take it for two or three days after, um, just around the clock. Um, hopefully that helped. Sorry I made the um, mistake with uh, Tramadol and Toradol. Um, hold on, there's more questions. I'm sucking at this soon. Oh, no, a new people I answered. Dismissing a new now. Dismiss. All right. Uh, Dr. Davis, I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you so much for doing the talk and um, sharing us about opioids. My pleasure. Bye. Uh, 
All right. Thank you.